Mark, it's December, so you know what that means? It's time for the Savage Geese Cars of the Year. I thought you were gonna give me my Christmas present today. You're gonna tell me all about your new Corvette <laughs> and your Corvette jacket well, and... My new balances are in the mail. So Mark, our rules for our car of the year is it can't be, or cars of the year, is it can't be a car we nominated last year. And it has to be a car we drove this year, either on or off camera. So we're gonna get questions like, why isn't the Rivian on this list? Why isn't the Model S Plaid on this list? Well, we didn't drive those cars. And we can't drive every single vehicle. Like the Prius launch was this week. We didn't drive the new Prius yet. You'll get that next year. Yeah, there you go. Everything that we didn't drive this year will make the bus next year because <laughs> we're that lazy. So let's start with the fun topic of the worst car of the year to begin with. There were quite a few runners up this year, like the Ford Explorer Timberland, oh, the yeah. Mercedes EQB, but the car that won the worst car of the year, according to Mark, is the EQS lineup of cars. <laughs> Well, the EQS specifically, yes. right? I, I think if you watch that video, it, you'll see why it's we're in a weird place for the future of vehicles. There's, there's this thought to putting technology first before everything else to a fault, and that's the epitome of like I, I think that was the car where you just saw there were too many people like we got to do everything. We have to do everything, and that's how that car turned out. It's a total mess. Yeah, if you look at something like the S-Class, you can argue that the technology is too much, but the S-Class as a luxury car is really, really impressive. All they needed to do is make it ride and be as quiet as the S-Class and make it an EV, and they missed that mark entirely. So not only is it the worst car, it's also one of the worst missed opportunities of the year from, from a manufacturer. And coming from Mercedes, they should know better, to be entirely honest. The worst infotainment of the year, Mark. Can you guess what you, what you nominated? I don't remember now. I mean, there's so many bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> it is VW. It is so yeah. bad that, thank God, they are fixing it. They are apparently having weekly meetings to figure out how to add switches back into the, their interior space. Yeah, they're going to have to spend some money to fix the, the money they saved by going buttonless before. So we knew, and we had heard this several years ago, where they had an internal mandate through upper management and their design team that they wanted to go with a car with no buttons. It was all touch, and uh, that didn't work out too well. Speaking of all touch, one of the worst infotainment designs for when it comes to usability is the Mercedes EQ Hyperscreen. Thankfully, you can't get it because it's been back ordered for two years, but if you wanted one, you should not. It is a mess. It is too big, it's pointless, and it's distracting. But it has, you can control the fragrance. You can, you can have, yeah. it smells like Walmart cologne <laughs> that you can spray all over your passengers. All right, let's, let's move into some positivity, Mark. Are okay. you ready for that? Yeah, please. All right, best infotainment usability. Well, you nominated three, and I'll let you pick between the three. There's Toyota Connected. That's sort of the most improved infotainment over the years. They went from being a company that used something that was 400 years old to spending a lot of time and effort to, to modernize it and make it usable. We have a video on that. If you want to learn all about it, watch that. The Mazda infotainment, it's idiot proof. It's really simple to use. And the BMW iDrive 7. Sadly, they're going away from that. <laughs> right, yeah. But <laughs> iDrive 7. It's still in some cars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so which of those three? Which one are you going to pick? Um, I think you have to give it to BMW just from a level of consistency. They started it and they've been really good at updating it and improving it and improving it, and they stuck with largely the same design. It's fast, uh, it gets updated, they know exactly what data har to harvest from users to it improve things. It has physical things. switches. It used to have physical switches for everything, and it's just, it's really easy, easy to use once you get involved in it. The Toyota Connected is great because it's simple. Right? Like they knew exactly what the users wanted up front and they didn't try to do more than that. There are some serious holes in it in terms of like what they do to expand it out, which again, they're gonna use data collection to figure out what people are actually using and not using to improve that interface. This is the future of cars. But I mean, in terms of a scalable interface, it's pretty amazing. Uh, although you take a look at like GM 
and their Android Automotive looks almost identical in terms of user interface. So they're kind of going to run into that where other brands are going to have something similar and it's going to get watered down. But anyway, that's where I'm going to leave it. The best or biggest improvement for an OEM, we nominated Jeep and we're going to give it to Jeep. The Grand Cherokee, the Grand Wagoneer are a huge step, albeit these are not the best SUVs, the best luxury vehicles, but you look at where Jeep was coming from with things like the old Compass, the old Grand Cherokee, and where they're at now with an all new platform and some more money behind them, they have come a long way. Again, I'm not saying they make the best vehicle in the world, but from where they were to where they are today, Jeep has done a good job. Take a look at a 12 year old Cherokee and a 12 year old Ram and then look at their 2022, 2023 equivalents and just sit in there and be like, how is this the same company? Now that doesn't mean it's gonna work long term, <laughs> but I mean, in terms of like uh, on the surface and some of the technology and even drivetrains and drivability is just, it's unbelievable how much they've evolved. All right, let's talk about two other topical things before we get into cars. Best audio system of the year. We nominated a bunch of Bowers and Wilkins systems. Yeah. Uh, basically, the best system I think we tested though was the BMW iX. 100%. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely really, really special, and you're going to see that carried over into the i7. Uh, it's it's going to be a variation of that. So those two Bauer systems, that's one company that if you see Bowers on it, typically every, every car we've tested with a Bowers has been... Even if it's average, it's way better than like most of the, the generic Bose, the Harmons, the AKGs, all that. So if you like audio, that's a car you want to hear. All right, let's talk about worst audio system to sort of balance <laughs> that out. While this is not necessarily the worst audio system in the world, it's probably the most disappointing, and that is the Macintosh audio system found in the Jeeps, not to bring up Jeep again. But <clears throat> they build this as a premium audio system to, to rival things like Ravel in a Lincoln yeah. or the Bowers in BMW and Volvo products. It's not. It's not very good. It's definitely a system that should be free in most cars. It's not as bad as something like the audio system in the Honda Pilot or Honda Passport. Or the bed, Ridgeline. Or I the think, Ridgeline, uh, yeah. yeah. The Ridgeline probably was, if you want to hear the worst audio system ever made, That that's it. Like, <laughs> I mean, the the AKG, or I'm sorry, the Macintosh in yeah. the, the Jeep, it, it's not that it's like horrible like the Ridgeline. It's just their choice and how they did the sound signature of putting bass like to a 10 like at the base setting, like just you get in the car, everything's neutralized. The you can't turn, you can't get the base controlled in it. It just sounds like you're in a club with five sub subwoofers around you, and it, it it's not good. The Cadillac Lyric, at least the one I tested on the launch program, is sadly we still don't have our press car, so I can't test it with objective measurements. Also should be nominated, but again, we haven't actually yeah, spent a lot of time numbers. with it. All right, let's talk about cars now because that's why you're here. Let's start with the best cheap or entry level truck and we gave that to the ford maverick congratulations ford it is well it does everything for an affordable price we always talk about things aren't cheap anymore yep. but it's cheap it's in the low 20s assuming you can get one you can get the hybrid front wheel drive get 40 miles the gallon and have a yield time you liked it didn't it's you? the perfect shit box truck without feeling like it's horrible it, it's like a throwback it's exactly what we need in the affordable budget segment there should be cars like the Maverick. There should be trucks like the Maverick to serve that public service of having a twenty to thirty thousand dollar product that is not horrible. I mean, I don't know how it's going to hold up long term, but if you're looking for a truck that does most everything an urban truck should do, it's it's really great. Yeah, and hopefully that is going to be the truck you see kind of utilize the parts companies, yeah. construction companies. It does everything really, really well. The next thing to talk about in sort of that affordable range is the best affordable daily driver. You gave it to the Honda Civic, and here's why. It does everything. It can be pretty much everything. You want a sedan, you want a hatchback, you want a sports sedan and an SI, you want a Type R. It can kind of be that everything product. It's big, and it sort of renders things like a CUV somewhat irrelevant because the hatch is so enormous. Yeah, I think the, the, the biggest tell of that is you take the, the lift back or the hatchback yeah. and you, you park <clears throat> it there and you have a normal person open the doors and look at how much back space is on the back seat and you lift up that hatch and you park something like a CX-30 next to it, like a Mazda yeah. CX-30, not to throw that under the bus. But you can see how 
how great the Civic is when you put it next to some of the CUVs and it drives good. The software, the technology is better than average. I mean, just everything about that car is as, as good as you can get for that vehicle that you could afford and drive every single day and you're, you, you, you never second guess it. The Mazda 3 is an honorable mention for yep. both of us as well. But the Mazda 3, what it does wrong is it's not as usable from a mm. space perspective, but what it does right is it looks great and it sort of does that faux luxury car thing. We're gonna talk about it in an upcoming comparison test with an Integra, but what Mazda's done, particularly in the higher price points, has pushed that to almost be like an A3 competitor, like an yeah. entry-level luxury car. Yeah, the, the Mazda 3, the hatch, specifically the hatch, and I guess the sedan's the same way, they have more of that special factor to them. I think they did spend a lot of time on that car to make sure that it wasn't so cookie cutter. Um, and part of chasing that exterior design that they did really sacrificed visibility a lot. There, you lose a lot of visibility out the rear quarters and it does feel very cramped in the back and then and at least in the hatch. When you compare it to like a Civic, and I know the Civic's a bigger car, but that's where it's like, do I want the aesthetics and like the beauty of some of the design or do I want the usability? And that's why the Civic wins out because it's more of a car for more people while still not feeling like a total... Crap can. Yeah, yeah. The next category, according to this list, is the best entry-level CUV. And, well, big surprise if you watch the videos, we're giving it to the RAV4. It is a total washing machine on wheels. It's not exciting, but they don't break. It's very, very large, and it's just a reliable vehicle. We probably would have given it to something like the CRV, but, again, we didn't drive it. I have no yeah. idea how it drives. And you wanted to give us some honorable mentions like the CX-50 and the Hyundai products as well. Yeah, the CX-50 is is interesting because it, it blends like what you expect from the RAV4 a little bit with the CX-5. Um, the problem with the CX-50 is it lacks something to it. And I can't particularly talk about it. Like, you know, when we talked about steering, it's like, my God, the steering is great in it, but then you drive it longer and it's like it's too heavy for what that thing is. So there's this weird stuff about it where the RAV4 is just like everybody can buy it. It's the same reason why the Civic's so great. You, anybody's going to get into it and they can live with it. Um, the Hyundai products, you know, Hyundai and Kia specifically, their SUVs, the way they've evolved them are quite amazing. Like they are special vehicles in that regard, but they've had so many quality issues and problems and just like from... The Kia boys and the theft rings from stupid shit like that, not even seeming to care <laughs> about that as a brand. And then all the engine failures and all the quality stuff and the warranty issues. I, that's why I've kind of like soured. soured on it. You know, it's hard to recommend that, namely as a commodity car. You know what we're talking about. We're not talking about, oh, these are not specialty vehicles where like, you know, a small subset of These are like purely appliance vehicles. Right. You're buying them as a family or as a person who needs to go places, not care about anything, right. just make sure it works and can fit all your crap. And that's the appeal of a vehicle like this. The next vehicle topic is best family full-size vehicle. And you gave it to the Toyota Sienna. I did. This is a hard category because... You're looking at three row vehicles mostly, right? Big haulers. So immediately everybody knows the minivan is the best for this. You have cars like the Kia Carnival, which again gets put on the side for the same reasons we said before. Um, the Sienna is amazing in its segment because of its fuel economy. I, I would say that the hybrid part makes it even more boring and appliance like. But when you're driving a boring car and you're getting high 30s and 40 miles per gallon in a three-row vehicle, it's in, in the seating configuration, all that stuff's amazing. It's not as good as the Pacifica because you can't fold that second row into the floor and you can't take out that second row of seats, which really sucks. Um, but it, everything else about it is amazing. And if you can't have a minivan and you just refuse to do it, then you're in the Palisade and the Telluride. And they are both amazing SUVs for what they are. And we spent a lot of time in those. Yep. And I can see why people are paying over sticker for them because that's how good they are for their price points. Where they get hurt again is potentially long-term reliability, potentially dealership experience, yeah. and the fuel economy. It's not anywhere it's not as good. good as the Sienna. It's not good, but you get a V6, you know? And S speaking of V6s, Mark, <laughs> let's talk about trucks. All right. Best full-size truck, F-150. <laughs> pretty straightforward it does everything well they have a huge budget it's one of the more modern architectures you can get a v8 you can get a v6 
You can get it as a Raptor. You can get it as a regular vehicle. They're good because Ford knows their customer base and they have a lot of money to put into this platform and they listen to their customer base. While the Ram may be more luxurious on the inside, it may ride better, all of our experience with Rams is they're not particularly reliable. Yeah, that's a hard one. You know, like you you talk to five different people and you might get five different mm-hmm. answers on these trucks. I think we're taking the F-150 and personally, I'd rather be in a Ram to drive if I had a warranty. But at the same time, looking at it from the body structure, from the engineering, from the money that Ford puts into this and the know-how, along with the drivetrain choices, it, it really is. It's the best truck on the planet. Let's talk about the best entry-level luxury sedan. So this is typically, in our mind, we're skipping over A3 and all the other fun stuff. We're looking at the 3-series fighter. And our best entry-level luxury sedan is the es sedan from Lexus, either as the hybrid or as the V6. The reasons you gave Mark is it's basically a comfortable boat that gets good MPG, doesn't have any real problems, and is going to be very, very reliable. Yeah, and you have two drivetrain choices that are absolutely amazing with a hybrid system that does not fail and a V6 that will go 20 years. You know, and you could argue the fact that it's not the best driving car in terms of like handling, it's it's not there, but overall refinement, luxury appointments, and the fact that you literally can buy this car and keep it forever, that's very, very rare to say. And at that price point, pretty much loaded around $50,000, we've looked at all these other sedans and you start going well above that and you're not getting a lot more for what you're getting there. And that's why I'm always like preaching that preaching that car the best full-size luxury sedan we're saying big boy luxury sedan like an s-class fighter or an ls is the genesis g90 it's the one genesis or hyundai product on this list the reason we gave is genesis has essentially unseated lexus at the do everything luxury sedan for the money you look at what that car does how comfortable it is how quiet it is how the interior is laid out the interior electronics it's better than a Lexus LS. It's way better than a Lexus LS. And we talked about that in our G90 video. Um, and it it does not have the 7 Series architecture of like ride refinement or the S-Class ride refinement. That's where it gets hurt. They do not, they still haven't figured out suspension and like ride refinement, but they figured out everything else like in terms of that. Like that's what they, they're, and they know that they're smart because most of the buyers understand that they will trade off that for everything else. And the G90 is a perfect example of how you blend physical controls, technology, gimmicky features, and like a library, like living room environment on the inside. It's it's just such a cool car for $100,000, mind you. You know, that's- a, It's a lot of money, but it's but, way less than an S-Class. Uh, 100%, and a, a BMW or an Audi. Like I love, I love the 8 or A8, yes. S8, amazing car, but it's a lot of money, man, and you're not getting a lot more there. Yeah, what you're getting from the Germans is a better drivetrain. Quite yeah. frankly, yeah. the V8s and the 6s from the Germans are far, far more sophisticated, right. smoother, better imp- implemented than the Genesis drivetrain. Oh, 100%. But you're paying less money, way less money. Yep. The best sports sedan, this was not a very big uh, segment of vehicles, and you can thank me for this one, is the CT5V Blackwing. It's got a supercharged V8, a manual, it goes sideways, it sounds great. And it goes sideways. <laughs> I, I would argue that a close second place would be the RS3. Yes. They are dramatically different in price. The RS3 as a sports sedan, a performance sports sedan, gives you a lot. But it doesn't have a manual and it doesn't go sideways, Mark. No, you're right. But the engine is amazing. It's yes. probably the most special experience outside that, that black wing that you talked about. If you, like, you had to have a sedan, and I know they're totally opposite ends of the spectrum, but... The engine makes up for a lot of deficiencies of going sideways, so. Yeah, I I don't disagree (laughs) with you. All right, let's talk about the best, say, sub $50,000. I hate to say it's affordable, but sports car that does everything. And you're going to give it to your own car, Mark. What? The Civic Type R. The Civic Type R is in an affordable, well, (laughs) (laughs) I, I guess we have to cover this separately, but if you got this car for what it's actually worth at $44,000, it's the same reason it's great and why the Civic is the best car in terms of like that small car. You're amping up everything else. 
It feels edgy to drive. You can go from like a comfort setting on the street where it's completely tolerable and enjoyable to drive and usable to making you feel like you're gonna bounce out of your seat on a, a bumpy track. There's the, the manual, the inputs. I was telling you this today. Things like the turn signal, like no digital shit, just clicks like really solidly. The volume, the track selector on the steering wheel, click, click. I mean, the seats, the seats are like, they're probably, and I know it's played out. We, we've heard other people say this. The seats are something that you would probably find. They're better in, than seats in like a Porsche. Yeah, no, they are. I mean, they're incredible. So the main things that you're using for driving, steering wheel, shifter, seats, people are going to ask, why would you spend 45000 plus on a front wheel drive car? And I would say, I don't know why you would either, honestly. And it, it, that's how special that car is. And if you're a person that has driven rear wheel drive cars and you like different cars like your buddy or our buddy Gibran, he's got yeah. Porsches, he's all this, and he's still interested in a Type R. It's for people that love cars that don't have tunnel vision on this is the only way a sports car should be. I'd rather drive the Type R than this thing behind us. Uh, uh, for a daily commuter, yes. So there's something that they've, they've unlocked there and it, it is amazing, but it's not for everybody. The honorable mention is the Elantra N. I hate to call it the Kirkland or Great Value version <laughs> of the CTR. It is 97% of that car yeah. for $10,000 less. Yeah. It is essentially the same price as a GR86, but it's probably every bit as fast, if not faster than a GR86. It's usable, has a long warranty. You can get it as, as a dual clutch automatic, which is very good. You can get it as a manual, and it's nearly as fast, not as fast, but nearly as fast as a CTR. In terms of performance, you're almost matching the Type R. Um, you're trading off a lot of other things like the Hyundai factor yes. that we talked about earlier. But honestly, if you have an Elantra N, you have a very special car and you know it, it's only under the Type R because the Type R is definitely has more pedigree. It's more sorted out where the N brand for Elantra, as we've joked about, is like, it was kind of a pet project. Now that Beerman's been replaced or gone or retired, who knows what they're gonna do with it. It's going EV. So it's like, it's not completely sorted out, but that's also what makes the Elantra and really, really fun. There's like rawness to it. It's a car we came in with zero expectations. Yes. I didn't like the way it looked. Yeah. I didn't really love the interior, but when you drive it on track, it yeah. takes like five seconds to be like, this is an amazing car. It is an amazing car, very amazing experience. And at the price, that's the big thing, right? If you're getting it for like $38,000. $38, $33,000. <laughs> it's unbelievable <laughs> what you're getting there. So it almost should be first because yeah, of that. But it's that five or 3% yeah, difference right. of the CTR that I think makes that car so special. If you told me a CTR was 60,000 with a dealer markup and you could get an Elantra N for like 35, you buy an Elantra, Elantra N 10 out of 10 times. Yep. I, All right, so going back to a less exciting topic, best entry level luxury SUV. We nominated the X3 with an honorable mention of the Macan. Mm. The X3 is far less money. It basically is a small X5. Yeah. The Macan drives better, but a Macan can also almost be $100,000, which is way too much money. I, I would honestly switch that list around a little bit. I would go RDX. Really? I, I think the RDX is really, really good, and it's underappreciated. For We're talking about like lower price. Yeah. RDX, X3, Macan, Macan, in that kind of order of price. And as that price goes up, the, if you have Macan money, it's the best micro SUV thing. But it's like, not very big. It's not very big. It's it's like a glorified hatchback on wheels, and it's way too much money. But if you have that money, you're going to choose it every time. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just true. But the X3 is incredible and for what it is. And it's $60,000. You get a B58, which is arguably one of the best engines Somebody in the world. Somebody said they should you sh they should do shots every time Jack mentions the B58, because <laughs> you always mention the B58. <laughs> All right. The next one is the mid-sized luxury SUV. We gave it to the X5 with the honorable mention of the Cayenne. Same argument as the last yeah. part of this. You buy an X5 because you're a frugal rich person. Yeah. And if you are an actual very rich person, you buy a Cayenne. And you could also bring in the MDX Type S into yeah. that list. Although that's a bigger vehicle that could... No, I, actually, I'd do the same thing. The MDX Type S is probably Acura's best product. Yes. Like by a long stretch. Yep. So, you know, again, that order. <laughs> MDX... X5, the X5, Cayenne. Cayenne. Yep, and you could probably slot in the Q5, Q7 in there, to be honest. They just feel dated at this point. Like, they need to be updated, I think, more so on the interior. Yep. But uh, anyway. 
The next topic is the best luxury SUV. We gave it to the BMW X7. It, it's big. It has a tremendous set of engines. One of them you can do a shot as a B58. The other one is the <laughs> twin turbo V8. Um, the other honorable mention in the full size big boy SUV is the Escalade. Will it be in a garbage can in three to five years? Probably. Well, but, 10 years. Well, well, no, I'm sorry, seven years. Seven technically. years when all the OLED screens burn out, but <laughs> no. so will Mark's X7, so yeah, that's true. Oh, oh well. I mean, they're kind of like throwaway lease cars to, when you're getting to this price point, but the Escalade is that truck version of the X7 if you want that. It does things better in many ways, but it does things worse in terms of the luxury refinement part. The best off-roader. The video was not out yet, but we did drive it this year. It is the Bronco Raptor. I prefer it to the TRX. I prefer it to the regular Raptor. I prefer it to the Raptor R because it sort of kind of drives like a sporty car or a sports car. It's surprisingly fun to drive on the street. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a special vehicle, 100%. It may not be the fastest thing, uh, but it makes up for it in the fact that it looks very, very unique. It's like a children's toy come to life. It's got a shorter wheelbase, so that means it's more lively to drive. I, when he said, you're gonna, this thing's amazing. I'm like, this guy is, <laughs> he's got screws loose now and it doesn't have a B58 in it. So how could you like it possibly? But yeah, it's really, really good. The best EV. This was a Mark decision because well, it was a Mark decision. He rules this company with an iron fist. He gave it to the BMW iX with an honorable mention of being the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Why? Uh, the iX is an engineering masterpiece, aside from the way that that thing looks. I wish it was more X5 in terms of usability. That would fix almost everything. But if they could just fix those parts of that car and take all the engineering that's in there and, and kind of do X5 it a little bit more, I, and give it obviously the next gen battery with more range and 800 volt architecture for quick charging. I mean, I make a lot of excuses, for it. <laughs> but it, it, the potential is there. It's so good engineering wise that and the audio system. Like, there's certain things about it that are amazing. But honestly, for a regular person, that the EV or Ionic, Ionic Five is is unbelievably good for what it is. The one thing I will say is, before you furiously type, why isn't there a Tesla Lucid? or Rivian on that list, well, we never drove them. That's why they're not on this list. I'm yeah. sure they're very impressive vehicles. We will try to remedy that for next year, but Tesla doesn't have a press fleet. Rivian didn't put us in a car, and Lucid doesn't know who we are. The last two topics, Mark, I don't want to deprive our audience of this if they just sat through a 25-minute video. <laughs> um, the last two topics, the driver's car of the year is the first one. The driver's car of the year is a a vehicle that it may not be the fastest car, may not be objectively the best vehicle, but it's a car that makes you smile and laugh while you drive the vehicle. And it's an experience that is slowly going away as cars become more automated, less involved. The car we gave it to is the GT4 RS. While the GT3 would definitely be on that list, but we gave it as the car of the year last year, it's not. The GT4 RS is a car that you feel something while you drive it. The sound is something that you and I still think about. We brought up how it sounds like a slightly less special LFA in that like mm. way you just smile. It's so intoxicating. No, it's not dynamically the best vehicle in the world. You basically can't get one anyway, and it's hyper expensive. But when you drive that car, you forget about everything else. Yeah, I would agree with that. The, the GT3, just to be clear, is a better car than the GT4 RS. It just is. It just doesn't sound as good. <laughs> so it, it's that weird part about how we talk about sound in cars. And you'll notice a lot of the vehicles on this list or on these lists where we're talking about the best cars or best sports cars, it always involves some type of sonic part of it. Like the RS3, a lot of that is the engine sound. That car would be completely irrelevant if they just threw a four popper in there. Yeah. I mean, honestly. So it, it's something about tuning that induction noise to make you feel something. It's the same reason why big movie scores like hit you. You know, everybody remembers the Star Wars theme or the Indiana Jones theme or, or music or sound design. It's, it's part of the human experience and these special sports cars deliver that usually because of that. Uh, our, that, that GT4 RS is 100% dominated by that experience. And none of the sound is fake. It's yeah. real engine noise and it's a car designed by people who love driving. On that note though, for many people, this is probably not surprising, our car of the year altogether is the Corvette C8 Z06. Mark and I were not the biggest fans of the original C8, 
but when you drive the Z06, theoretically, if you could even get one, much like the GT4, for its list price, which is what you should be paying for a car like that, that car starts at slightly over $100,000 and can go up to 165. And there is no car for that amount of money on the planet that will touch it performance. I think wise. it could go to 185. Yeah, you probably like even, even higher. More. Yeah. yeah. But what you should be paying is in the lower 100 yes, range. Yeah, sure. If you're paying for that car and you spec it out correctly, there's nothing on the planet that touches it from a performance perspective. Outside of the car, it sounds incredible. It's unbelievably fast. And the team working on that vehicle are very, very passionate and great people to work with. Yeah, that's, that's a car that's interesting because there's two stories to it. It's their life's work. It was the buildup to all that work to be able to get a chance to work on this car, which is also why it makes it special from a person that loves the automotive world and engineering, right? That's what that car delivers on. It wasn't completely compromised and sacrificed like the C8 Stingray when it came out. You're like in it, like every, you could tell everything they wanted to do was like, uh, they, they put 10 layers of foam over everything. It's like, oh, we have to make this head to a price point. It's got to be for somebody that's going to like have... got to be comfortable and yeah, safe like, and all these things. Yeah, all the things. They didn't have to do that as much to this car. And the big thing is, let's be, let's be honest, the it's engine. the engine, right? And why is the engine special? Sound. Yep. And um, there's not too much else out there on the planet at this point that's being made that even competes with it. Any V8 revs to 86, 8500 RPM that makes 670 horsepower. And, and it's fast. It's, yes. not, it, it's, not just, it's not just the sound. Like the GT4 RS is like, okay, it's not the fastest car, but the, the Z06 is fast. I mean, it, it really is. It's going to be more than most people can handle. And then when you, you set it up right and you tire it right, it's going to be a car that is going to be a driver's car on track as well. So so with that, thanks for watching and congratulations to the Corvette team for winning. <laughs> I thought the Civic was the best car. Oh, well, uh, the CTR, Mark. Uh, Max Verstappen, who got paid a lot of money, said that's <laughs> yeah, the best the, car in the yeah, world. The, the F1 drivers and the celebrities that were paid to drive their car said it was the best. So it is.